Welcome. My name is William Messacar. I am a Master Model Railroader in the 4th Division of the Pacific Northwest Region of the National Model Railroad Association. And I want to welcome all of you to the virtual layout tour we'll have presented today by members of the NMRA. We would encourage you to find out about the NMRA and join in order to participate in these virtual tours. We have other virtual clinics and other activities for the National Model Railroad Association that we think you'll find uh, a big help to your modeling and you'll get to meet model railroaders just like you. So welcome to our tour and I hope you enjoy it. Our first layout tour today is Joe Green who lives up in Squim, Washington and he's going to tell us about his Rider Gap subdivision layout. Thanks Berg. Good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to the, the CNO Rider Gap subdivision. It's spring of 1974, and you are in the mountains of Virginia. The way I'm going to do the talk, we're going to have a couple of slides up front to give an overview of what I, of what the layout's about, what I'm trying to accomplish, and then most of the rest of the talk is going to be pictures, slide, excuse me, slides of different pictures of the layout. I included this one up front. We're going to come back to it about the middle of the presentation. But I included it because the first parts of the layout we see don't have a lot of scenery. So this is just sort of saying, if you like scenery, hold on, it's coming. We'll get to it in a little bit. So as I started to design the layout about 12 years ago in 2008 or so, there were two main goals that I had, two things that I knew from my previous layouts that I had built and, and experiences around model railroading that I knew were things that I really wanted to do. The first is I love building prototype scenes. That's, that really motivates me greatly. And there were uh, several places that I knew on the Chesapeake and Ohio that I wanted to model. Covington, Virginia, where I became interested in, in railroads originally, where I went to high school, two places in, Ca in West Virginia, Cass and Thurman. But there was a problem was that these scenes are actually on three different subdivisions on the Chesapeake and Ohio. They're maybe a hundred so miles apart. Um, and if I try to put them all in the same layout, it might not bother other people, but it would bother me, particularly if it didn't have the things in between them that like mountain ranges and large yards that, that are in between them. So that was one thing that I was wrestling with a bit. The other thing is I really enjoy industrial switching. I, I like switching layouts and industrial switching. I had some different plants that I knew of that in Covington, there's a paper mill and a Hercules plant. In Cass, West Virginia, there was a lumber mill. But I really had in my brain at that time that switching layouts were urban based. They're big cities. And, and how could I do this sort of mountain railroading as a switching layout? So the way I got around both of these problems was to first to go with a prototype freelance layout. The Chesapeake and Ohio, the Greenbrier subdivision, which is where Cass actually is, it was going to be the engineers, I should say, the engineering department proposed to management that it be built as a branch off of the Hot Springs subdivision. And actually the board itself overturned that plan and built it a different way. So I decided I would build the railroad the way the engineers said that it should be built. And the Greenbrier subdivision would go through the Ryder Gap into West Virginia. So that's where I picked up the name Ryder Gap subdivision. And based on this prototype freelance layout, I would pull in scenes that I wanted to model into this, uh, into my imagined history of how this developed. The second thing I would do, I decided just to minimize the compression with any, within any one scene. Uh, the compression is usually two to one or less. For instance, the paper mill that I built, which is uh, based on a West Vaco plant in Covington, Virginia. I think that plant has about 25 spurs inside of the plant, tracks with inside the, the plant. Back Creek paper on my layout has 13. And by minimizing the compression, that means I can get a lot of operations, a lot of switching with the, uh, the few large mills that exist in the mountains of this area that I'm modeling. So based on that, within the, not, the, the space I have is a little over 900 square feet. There are actually only three locations. There's Intervale, which is a junction yard just off the uh, CNO main line. Mountain Grove, which is the largest part of the layout, which has a paper mill, chemical plant, a uh, large freight yard, and also an engine facility. And then Mill Gap has a, a, a large lumber mill. The train building right here, it's 30 feet by 42 feet. It was actually built 
to house two RVs. You can see the doors. These are actually two RV doors on the side of the building. That's the space behind the doors is roughly 30 feet by 31 feet. Uh, so the first thing that had to happen was that that space had to be cleaned up. It was it was dirty and, and everything. Uh, it was cleaned up. My Both of my kids, Joshua and Beth, helped to convert it. They built a, a wall in front of these two doors, helped put up sheetrock and other things inside the room. Contractors put in a dropped ceiling about this level in the in the layout room and put in heat and electricity for me. In the front part of the building right here is a crew lounge, space for a crew lounge that we'll see in just a minute. And then across over here, just FYI, this is uh, Vancouver Island across the sound, across the strait, excuse me. And Victoria, Canada is right about there. So, excuse me, as we come into the crew lounge, uh, this was semi-finished when we got there. I think they were literally going to make this a space for their mother-in-law at one point, and then that didn't happen. So we had the floor put in, had the kitchen area put in here. The two most important places in this crew lounge are the, the kitchen table where we eat lunch. Crews, during the operating session, crews spend most of their time in the layout room itself. So we use it for lunch a lot. The other important thing is the sink right there. My modeling table, my modeling space is right on the other side of this door. So I spend, I, you know, when I'm up, uh, modeling, I'm cleaning out paint brushes and other things in this sink quite frequently. And I'm, I greatly appreciate having it that close. So we come in through the crew lounge, through this door right here. And what we're going to see is we're going to come in this way. We're going to see intervail first along this wall. We're going to see the uh, intervale it comes to about here. There's a lift out in front of an emergency exit. Then we're going to enter Mountain Grove. Mountain Grove, there's a yard lead on for the yard that's stretching around here into the freight yard, the main part of the yard there. Around, there's a yard on the other side as it comes into the engine facility called May Yard. We're going to go through the engine facility here. And we're going to come into the paper mill. This is the uh, this whole peninsula here is the paper mill. So Mountain Grove is about half the layout room. It goes from here to here. We're going to skip this area right here. It's pretty much temporary space right now. And we're going to come into Mill Gap. Actually, if we were coming by the railroad, we'd come off of a branch line right here that stretches into Mill Gap. This is a town area at the, right here. And then we'll come into Mill Gap Lumber, which is right here. And that's the lumber mill. And from there, we'll go on to the next slide. We're coming into the layout room. Uh, this is the temporary area that I talked about. My wife refers to this as the store. I love doing scratch building. And probably it was well worth it to me to spend the money to sort of build up a, an inventory of scratch building supplies so that when I am working usually have what I need there. We're going to come down here, down this aisle. This is the beginning of Intervale right here that I talked about. So Intervale yard here. This is the yard. This photo here is, is looking back at this end of the yard. Uh, originally, I conceived of this as just being a staging yard. And fortunately, at some point, I decided to change it from a passive staging yard to an, an active junction yard that has added a lot to the operations. Probably not prototypical. The, the CNO almost certainly would have just run locals in from Clifton Forge, which is about 15 miles south on the main line, the main main line of the, the CNO. But uh, this helps a lot from an operational perspective. We're also on this side, you can see the back sides of two Bolina curves. So these are the, the two peninsulas that I showed on the track plan. And for those, for those of you who are not familiar with a Bolina curve, basically it's a backdrop. It allows you to put a backdrop on the end of the, the, um, the, the peninsula here. So this one is intentionally shorter so you can look down into the scene. This one intentionally higher so that you can't. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come around this way down that aisle. It is patterned after the yard in Covington, Virginia. So we have a few prototype photos here. This is the west end of the yard. We've got the, uh, you can see this very 
compound ladder going in or on a curve there. You might also notice that the tr tracks are full of cars. This yard is primarily inventory for the paper mill in town, the West Vaco mill that was built in 1900. But you can see this compound ladder on one end. On the other end, it's actually a simple ladder, again, full of cars. This road bridge is where this photo was taken from. And I included this photo because we're going to see a model of that in a couple more slides. The uh, area itself right now has very little scenery. You can see the, the compound ladder here on the west end of the yard. On that end of the yard is the simple ladder. And there's one of the yard leads that goes all the way around to here. Right about there is where I cross the tracks to get to high school. And that's where my whole interest in railroads and the Chesapeake and Ohio started right about somewhere in there. So when I said there isn't a whole lot of scenery, there's actually some scenery right here. This is uh, Chessie's Christmas World. This is my wife's layout. Chessie was a chocolate lab. It's in memory of him. He passed away a few years back. My wife got into this. So she's, she built the buildings. Uh, she did all the scenery of this still a work in progress. She's crawled through the Walther's catalog and done all these details here in the scene. It's a Z scale. You can see we have school buses of children coming to coming in to see Chessie's Christmas World. So saving this, what we're going to do now is we're going to turn back around, start to head out of this part of the, uh, the layout. Here's the a model of that road bridge I showed you. Both this and Skateland is this building back here. They're both scratch built. This is the Bolina curve that I told you about, the short one. If you look at it, you can see how it, without it, we would just sort of be falling off into the, uh, into the aisle. But with it, we can build a scene here, a cut coming uh, through here. So coming through this cut, we're going to continue this way through the cut. And we got our first view of the paper mill here. Back Creek paper. I'll talk about, about the, the prototype mill here in a, in a couple slides, but this is Back Creek paper in my mind. It starts down here, just off there is where the wood chip pile would be. You come up into the pulp mill side, into the, the digester here, into a pulp processing in that area, bleach the paper here into the paper machines. This area is called the finishing and calendaring area of a paper mill. It's where the, the paper is coated and cut and it, it turned into the final product. Here's the warehouse for the outgoing paper. And this is the powerhouse uh, for uh, generating electricity for the whole um, the mill. And what I'm trying to, one of the things I was trying to do when I built this was to create a sense of the mass of a paper mill, but also to create the sense of history. So these buildings, uh, let's call those sort of a rose color. I'm name for it. They're all, if you see, they're all made out of Walther's uh, kits that have been kit bashed. Uh, so the color is the same, plus the windows are the same. And then you see the more yellowish tan buildings that have been scratch built back here to imply a second generation of buildings on the site. The prototype is actually a West Vaco paper mill that was built in Covington. Let me tell you how I got this picture. I, I Back 10, 20 years ago, I owned 15, 20 shares of Mead West Vaco stock. That's what it was called at the time. So I wrote the vice president of investor relations and said, I'm going to build a model of the Covington mill. Do you have anything you could send me? And I figured, you know, what a waste of a stamp, right? They're never going to reply to this. Less than a month later, I had a, a manila envelope with several uh, photos in it, two aerial photos, this being one of them, and, and I, you know, will this help you? Now, if you look at this, um, there's actually two paper mills, two soup to nut pulp and paper mills on this, in this photo. The first one is the old mill right here. And if you look, you can see the wood chip pile right there, the digester where they turn it into pulp. These were the paper machines. This was the warehouse right here. This is the main line of the CNO coming through here onto a railroad bridge. You can see how there's box cars uh, for the outbound paper. This is the cut uh, right here. The trains would come into here and shove cars back into the mill. You can actually, I think, I think those are coal hoppers, though I'm not sure. This is the powerhouse. So that's the first mill. You can see a river 
that comes here and cuts through behind. This this was a sulfide mill, but pulp mill with a very white paper. Across here, you can see another wood chip pile right there. It, there's a uh, right up here. There's the the conveyor up into the digester. This is a pulp mill. They, they, so on the opposite side of the river, they built a craft mill. A craft mill is uh, tends to build create a browner paper than the, the sulfite. In the late 40s, they, West Vaco figured out how to bleach the craft paper so white that they could use it as paper for paperboard. And at that point, they converted the entire mill into one big pulp and paper mill. So pulp on this side, then the pulp is slurried across and the paper mill is on this side. Here's the, again the main line. Uh, you can see they've expanded some of the mill there. The other thing I showed this photo is right up there is where Intervale is. If you remember, we came through the Intervale yard. Here's the main line. And so the idea is that the, the branch line would come up and there was a, be the junction yard right here as the branch continued north. This is a photo I took and I included it in part to show you the colors of the, of, that I was trying to capture with the different brick buildings and the history of the mill. So coming back, Here's a, a closer up of the paper mill. We're actually gonna go in reverse. We're gonna start with the, the warehouse, the outbound warehouse first. This is the Bolina curve, the taller Bolina curve. Without that, you'd be looking straight out into the aisle. Another thing I'd point out here is you see a caboose behind the engines. The CNO traditionally would run two cabooses on their locals, obviously one at the end of the train, but they would also have a caboose right behind the engines in front of the LCL car. And I think at least what I've heard, they did this so that the, the conductor could easily work the LCL traffic as the local went along. The, progress, the process was uh, ended in 1970 when the LCL traffic disappeared, but I have photos of them doing it well into the late 70s. In fact, I have a photo of like a, where there's an engine, caboose, three freight cars, and then another caboose. Looking at the they're now looking at the warehouse from the other side. One of the things that I, when I work on the layout, my attention span is about a few weeks on any one project. I'm usually working on several projects at a time. And then on any one project, after a few weeks, it sort of becomes work. Uh, so this building, the, uh, the, the warehouse, I probably worked on it four or five different times. I mean, I, I sort of did the basic structure and then stopped and then came back and did painting. And, and I've, I have found that that process works best for me on structures, but particularly on doing scenes. I'm best to you know, work on it for a while. And when it starts to get tired of it, just stop, go do something else, come back later, work on the scenes some more. And that, that process works best for me. Another thing you might be looking, you might go and hold it. Didn't we just see these engines in the, uh, the last photo? Well, one of the parts of a switching layout is you don't need many engines. I mean, we have four crews, and the four crews use a total of five engines. So uh, if you like a lot of engines, maybe a switching layout isn't the way to go. If having a few engines and spending a little bit more effort on them is, is something you're interested in, this might be what you want. Looking a little further into the mill, this cut of cars is actually on the set out track. At least in 1937, you know, the CNL had a map that the set out tracks for the freight yard were by the paper mill, which was maybe a mile away. And I just decided that was a great idea that that would help the operations be more interesting. So I put the set out tracks in front of the mill, similar to the, uh, to the prototype, at least in 1937. You can start to see down here, you can see the wood chip pile, the digester again. You can see some houses that were across from the, these are actually, I'm pretty sure were company houses originally built for the paper mill. One of the things I was trying to accomplish in this area, when you look in big mills, you often see a lot of empty track as the railroad is, is trying to you know, reach into the mill to get, to put the cars where they need to be. So in this photo, there are actually five different places where they, we have cars. We have one or two in here, a couple in there, two box cars, three tank cars, and I think a couple, two covered hoppers here. So there's a, close to 10 cars spotted in this picture, but there's still a lot of, of empty track 
which also have, turns out to be uh, useful during the operations because when the crew comes into the mill off the main, they have track to work here as they're working the different to work in the mill. So we're going to keep moving down this way. Actually, I think the next picture is, is here looking back at the, the paper mill side. This creek on the prototype, there was a river between the paper mill and the pulp mill. Didn't have room for that, but we have a little creek here. And this is the pulp mill side. Uh, again, we see these. I'm going to point out these, these houses because we're going to see them later. In this scene, between the houses and the wood chip pile, there's a, a, a branch line that's going that way into Mill Gap. And this backdrop here is actually curving. You can see a line there. That's actually the backdrop curving around in order to allow that to happen. And then the, this paint is actually the same color. It's just the light hitting it differently as we look on it. Uh, the pulp mill was one of the first things I built, and I would probably enhance it some. I'd probably bring some of those yellow buildings back into here to, to try to tie the pulp mill side and the paper mill side together. A little bit. One last picture here of the paper mill. We've got the, uh, the wood chips and the, the pulp wood. They were using both at this time. You, can, you can't have a big enough wood chip pile. The wood chip pile alone would probably take the whole peninsula. So we'll come back to this picture that we've been through the paper mill. Here on this side, which I'm here a little bit and see how we're doing for time. The paper mill on the other side is the uh, the engine facility, May Yard, and we call it. The freight yard is, is on over here on the, on the other side of the backdrop. So I intentionally put this scene here to create more run so that the when people are going to the from the mill back to the freight yard, they have more, more run. There's actually close to a scale mile between the two. Also to point out in this photo, the, the fascia is dark green, has we got black down here. All, all of this dark color is intended to keep your eyes up on the layout up there. You also notice that the fascia is very clean. The only thing on the, I have on the fascia are the, the throttle holders around the layout. The switches are all hand throws. The no throb, no, no toggles on the, the fascia. Underneath here, it, there's a uh, recessed underneath the, the fascia is a place to, to place things like pencils and items like that. So there's a shelf. If crews can hang there, a clipboard from these uh, screws actually that are along there. You also notice that there are no waybill boxes on the layout. The waybills, one of the things I wanted to accomplish in the operations is that crews work from switch list, you know, work from paperwork that's more what a real prototype railroader would work from. So the waybills are kept in a, uh, in, on desks where the crew lounge, where the, uh, excuse me, the yard clerks would work or the uh, conductors in their caboose would work. So I hope that's another way to keep the fascia clean. So coming over here into May Yard, May Yard is based on a place called Thurman, West Virginia. Uh, Thurman is a marshalling yard in what the, in, that the CNO built. It really captured the attention of modelers on the East Coast in part because of these brick buildings right here. The two end ones were both banks and there was so much coal money going through those banks that it made Thurman look like a very prosperous place to be when it really wasn't Thurman itself. It was the money and the coal money in the banks. This, these two pictures almost go together. If you know that's the coal tower here is the same as this coal tower. So these brick buildings are almost across from the old uh, engine house here. You've got mountain, there's a river right behind this engine house. You've got the engine house, two or you know, a few tracks of yard where the, the two mainline tracks, and then you've got a sidewalk. And the sidewalk goes right in front of these brick buildings and it's back into a mountain. So there is no main street in Thurmond. It is literally river, tracks, sidewalk, and these brick buildings. This is, the National Park Service still maintains this. You can go visit it. I assume no one's ever gotten hurt because this is still a very active CSX main cutting right through the National Park Service park here that uh, you can go see all this. So another sort of more atmospheric photos here some of these buildings and the water tanks you'll see as we go along. Here's the first photo of the area itself. So one of the things I found out 
as I was designing and building a switching layout, is that switching layouts are flat. Uh, most of the scenes are flat. In fact, I, I made the sort of short transitions between the scenes flat because it seemed like it would be gratuitous to try to change that. So to make it matter, it all comes down to the backdrop that I painted. And these are scenic express trees at the bottom with uh, polyfiber trees up here on, to, to create the rest of the forest. And I intentionally, uh, let me back say this a little differently. I mean, a lot of the advice is that you want to have a low horizon, right? So that, that the hills would be about this level. But I intentionally put these as high, much higher so that when you came into the aisle that you would feel like you were inside the mountains. In fact, on the, the paper mill side, I, I had to raise the mountains one inch. I, when I originally painted them, the height was such that my brain kept thinking I should be able to see over them to the other side. So I feel like I'm up above them. And it was just one inch of, of extra paint was all it took to get my brain to think I'm in the mountains now and I shouldn't be able to see over top of them. So they, that, this, this turned out to be pretty much a, something I had to learn how to do well in order to create the sense that you were in the mountains. You know, I don't have a whole lot to say about this photo other than I just liked it. This is the engine house, obviously. There is, I would point out that I, as I was building this, seeing it, I tried to make it look like we have some history going on in the area that this, for instance, that this track has been pulled out here. Now the steam engines have obviously gone there are some deliberate changes from Thurmond. If, if you remember, or people who might know Thurmond, there's a, a, Thurmond itself is on the CSX main line, the old CNO main line, and it was CTC, so there was a signal bridge right here. In my proto freelance layout, this is all dark, it's TTNO, so there's no, so I left that bridge out. The CNO coal tower is, I think, 300 tons because it's on the main. I used a 500, excuse me, a 50 ton coal tower that would be more appropriate for the branch line this is on. The engine facility here, that is pretty much prototype, the original uh, size. I think it may be off by a foot or two in each dimension. And giving that much depth, I think that's about a foot, about 12 inches, left a lot of area here along the front to be scenic, which was, you know, more work. But on the other hand, it also allowed some, the scene to develop in some additional ways. Coming from the opposite side here, the uh, the engine house was used as for repairs in the 70s. Obviously, with the steam gone, so we have cars being brought over to the rip track. The, we'll pull the tank cars. We're going here. The brick buildings here again. So when I am modeling, and particularly when I'm building scratch building, my goal is to make it look. You know, if I can make it look like the building, that's what's important to me. It doesn't have to be exactly like the building itself. And so when I built these, these were actually the first three brick buildings I ever scratch built, which was kind of uh, a little bit daunting given the, the uniqueness of, for instance, the bank here and, the, and this area here on this, this bank building. So one of the things I did as a shortcut is I didn't actually trim the insides of the windows. I figured that if I put the lower trim and the top trim, that that would be enough. But the other thing I thought was critical was to get, I don't know if that's a sash, I'm not sure what you call that, the uh, little wood across there splitting the window. I thought it was critical to get that straight. So it's actually not in the window. It's, it's a two by two, I think, or a one by two that's right behind the windows. This is actually like one long piece of two by two that I used a ruler to make sure I got it perfectly straight. So to me, when I'm scratch building, sometimes it's important you know, capture the important parts, the, the essence of the building, and then figure out how you can do it in a way that looks right and, and be happy with it. So as we turn now, we're, we're, we're now moving down to the, uh, the far end of the May Yard. This is, this crossover here leads you onto the branch line that goes to Mill Gap. CNO called their, their signal towers cabins. That's, this is JB cabin at the end here. It's actually the first building that's not would not be prototypically in the Thurman scene. The creek here, I, I had tried many ways to do water that, that I didn't, wasn't really happy with. It, it, it never quite turned out the right way, the ways you were supposed to. So this is actually the simplest thing I ever did. It's just masonite painted brown and a greenish brown, and then Mod Podge stippled on top. And that's, 
the simplest approach is probably the one that, I, at least for me, that I got the best results from. And then we have one last more close-up photo. You can see that the, the cabin has been abandoned and some of the windows are starting to break out of there. So with that, we, we're now going to take that branch and we're going to head back along the branch line to Mill Gap. So here we're coming into Mill Gap. If you remember, I, I said, I, I try to point out that there are these white houses. So this part of the scene is actually the scene behind the paper mill. And as I was designing the scenery, if you would, I had to figure out how to make it so that when you looked, when you looked at it from Mill Gap, it still looked appropriate. When I got to Mill Gap, I wanted to change the, the scenery techniques I was using. I wanted to start using, so you see you've got static grass here in the foreground, although we still have the foam on the other side of the tracks. I want to change how I did some of the backdrop painting to make it look further. The mountains in Mill Gap look like they're away from you a little bit further. Uh, and I just wanted to say some changes since we're on the other side actually of a, of a there's a big uh, backdrop right here. So you're kind of isolated when you're over in Mill Gap that allowed me to change my scenery techniques a bit. Uh, Cass, West Virginia is what Mill Gap is inspired by. This was the company store. Cass was a, a lumber mill. It was the original town was built in 1900 to produce pulpwood for the paper mill in Covington at the West Vaco mill. And in the process, they built a huge lumber mill. I think, it, I think in its day, it was like one of the two or three largest lumber mills on the East Coast. So this, this station and that building are right to the right of a company store. There's the, uh, it's actually the stage agent, the agent for the CNO who lived in that house that was in the former picture. So there's my version, we call it Mill Gap. Uh, we're starting into an area that's a little less done on the scenery, so I'm still working on the, in these areas. You can see the backdrop is painted so it looks like it's further away from you at this point. As we look further down this way, here's the end of the company store. These buildings are, are all from, they're all scratch built as um, from the, the uh, Cass area. This building was where you would live if you were a single actually single man, because I, I, to be honest, it was 1900, and I don't know that there were many or any women who worked on the lumber mill at that point. Uh, it's actually two buildings. There's a building here, a building here, there's lattice in between them, and then they had a shared porch in front of it. So that was kind of interesting to, to build. In this town, if you ever like everything in the wood, because it's a lumber mill, all the buildings were painted white, the, the houses were painted white, and what where you lived was based on who you who you were. Um, if you were a, if you were just a, a worker, or a single, you you worked in this you lived in this hotel. If you had a family, you were given a small house. Uh, if you were a boss, you got a bigger house. If you were the owner, you got the biggest house. So we're coming this way now into the mill itself. The mill is this is pictures of the cast mill. It was abandoned in 1960. So these pictures, I think, were from the late 60s, and you can see it's already getting overgrown. You can go, uh, you can go now and see it. This the boiler. This is the boiler house, which is right there, and so you're looking at the ruins of these warehouses. But I, but since it was abandoned in 1960, my time frame is 1974. I thought well, maybe it made more sense to assume that a nearby lumber mill, Bartow, this mill is about 15 miles away to assume that this lumber mill, instead of building a separate place, that, that they bought the cast site and built their new buildings on, the, uh, on that site. So that was my story, and I'm sticking to it. Here's the, the newer buildings that are being built. As you can see, I'm just really starting to work on the scenery in this area. These were going to be blue, like the, uh, like the prototype buildings were, until at the last minute, I decided I just liked green. So we turn those into green buildings. You can see the start of the older structures here, which come into here. So the, these are buildings actually I built for my layout back in San Jose, California. So these, this building is about 20 years old, and I think the rest of these are 15, 20 years old. This was actually the second building I ever scratch built right there. So a lot of work still to do here uh, to complete the scene. And the idea will be that this will be overgrown like that photos we saw. This is sort of the abandoned area. And then as we move into the newer area, it will be you know, well kept. So one last 
blasting for future developments. This barn was in Squim back, my, we took this picture back in 2007 or 2008. My wife loved it, so I promised to Janet that I would build the barn. 10 years later, I finally have built it. This was like the first thing I built under, you know, as, as we got restricted here on what we could do. It's, I think, actually the first building I've ever built board by board which I, I thought was fun. I enjoyed it, but it certainly takes longer. So someday we'll have a farm on the layout. One slide here on operations. I didn't talk much about the operations because we don't have time, but we have have, had 48 operating sessions. It, we were gonna have, I was gonna have op sessions 49 and 50 at SoundRail, but obviously that didn't happen. So we're stuck at 48 operating sessions. We have three to seven operators at a time in, in four one to two person crews operation sessions take four plus hours with a break for lunch. In addition, my, my son Joshua and I have operated the layout 11 times over the holidays. Uh, the first time I think probably took an hour because there was about 15 cars to move and now it takes us five or six afternoons to, to go through the entire operating session. And with that, I thank you. That's, a, that's our visit of the tour of the layout. Hopefully that was interesting for you and that, that, that's the presentation. Hello again. Um, this is a, another reminder that this uh, virtual layout tour has been brought to you by members of the fourth division of the Pacific Northwest region of the National Model Railroad Association. And we hope you've enjoyed it. And we want to encourage you to again, find out about the NMRA online. Uh, both PNR and NMRA have an excellent website where you can get information about joining and participating this and other activities like our clinics that are held all over the region. So thank you for joining us today and wish you great modeling.